Okay. Uh, absolutely delighted to have a, a wonderful uh, range of talent uh, around me. Um, and I've also got Barney Williams, uh, our playwright novelist. Well, Barney Norris, sorry. It's my middle here. name, no, Yeah, yeah. How Barney, do you know? Barney William Norris, yeah. sorry, uh, on my right. Uh, and I, I don't tell people that. Uh, well, I'm a good friend. You oh. know. And we have Laura Williams, who was conflated there. Oh, uh, I see. I see. The mind was moving uh, faster than the tongue. And we have Laura Williams, who is Barney's literary agent. He has two. He'll explain why later. Uh, and uh, we have Peter Bennett-Jones, uh, 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 of, uh, of incredibly well known through the through the the, the theatre, television, uh, art world generally, uh, for, for for an amazing range of things he's done through his career, and we're going to start by asking Peter to outline his journey uh, through the arts, and and uh, during that time we'll find out why uh, why young talent needs an agent and. Uh, and hear and be educated about a wide range of things. Peter, over to you. Okay, well, I mean, uh, one thing I always try is not to be well known. I think it's always <laughs> better to be uh, completely no profile in life. Uh, I mean, originally, uh, it was suggested to talk about how the new technology is affecting art and talent, but actually, I'd much rather just talk about, well, I, I just. Um, wrote it down, talent will out, just some observations really about the whole process of, of creativity, having been involved in various different aspects of it, and, uh, and, the, and the management of, of artistic talent, I suppose. And um, just a bit of background about me, you know, I went away to school, and I was telling uh, the guys earlier that... Uh, yeah, I think it's a university where you can find your um, metier, where you can choose your friends and choose your activities rather than being told what to do and how to do it, uh, which is really what happens at school and who to do it with. And I found I was, uh, you know, very lucky in an environment in uh, I went to Cambridge, um, the fine place up the road, and. Uh, you know, this, uh, my wonderful art master, Graham Drew, at school had said, you know, get, get stuck into what you want to do. You've got to be, it'll always be daunting, but be courageous about getting into a world you want to get into, and then you'll find kindred spirits and, uh, and see what you can do together. And that's really what happened. And I was very fortunate, and some of these kindred spirits happen to be extremely talented people. I used to think they used to grow on trees, people like, you know, Douglas Adams or... Mick Heitner or uh, Griffith Shens, but uh, they don't really, but there were quite a lot of them uh, in the, you know, and they are obviously, you know, do attract very talented people, these universities. <coughs> and um, so, you know, at, at university, going as a budding lawyer, I came out as a sort of impecunious theatre producer, really, because um, you, uh, you just get an opportunity to, to learn your trade in, <laughs> while studying for a degree in something else. Uh, and then with the Edinburgh festivals going on, and going, I remember taking footlights up to uh, Edinburgh in 1976. We had a very good show with Nick Heine, a guy called Jimmy Mulville, who runs Hat Trick Productions now, very good TV producers. Uh, Douglas Adams had directed the May Week version in Cambridge, actually, but it was four hours long, and I had to fire him. I fired him, actually, outside the Playhouse and said, I can't have four hours, it's going to be an hour. He said, I can't do that. So. Uh, Griffiths Jones took it down to an hour. Uh, but anyway, we were in a theatre at nine o'clock and did our show. It was pretty good and it was sold out. But at 10.30, there was an Oxford review. And I thought, oh, blimey, these, you know, our guys are pretty good, but these guys are something else. And that was Rowan Atkinson and Richard Curtis doing a show. And I thought, if I want to stay in this game, these are people I want to stay involved with. And I still work with them to this very day. And because uh, one great hint, when I asked Michael Grade, many, you know, decades ago, 25 years ago, probably, who used to be a big-time agent in his long career. And I said, Michael, what's your one tip as a talent agent? And he says, identify the talent, grab hold of the coattails, and never let go. <laughs> and, uh, and in a way, they, it's, it's, it was sort of good advice in a way, because you're as good as a, if you're in a producer or as an agent as the creative talent you're working with. And you can help them in the process, but they are the raw material, and you're the, you might be a match that lights it, but you're, you're not going to succeed without them, but they can probably succeed without you, 
which is why it's very important, in my view, in this business to be, you know, basically genuinely low ego. You know, I think you, it, it comes with the territory and having pleasure of working with people who are usually, in my experience, complicated. Because I think creative people, and I think it probably applies in other creative areas of work, I'm just talking about artistic creativity here, but there, there is a sort of complexity that goes with originality, I think. Um, and, uh, and if you like that, then you're in the right game. But if it irritates you, you know, my wife always said, I don't understand how you can put up with these people. I said, well, I genuinely like it. You know, I don't, I don't mind people having tantrums if it's to an end. Um, so, so I got involved first for, in, in theatre. Um, took Shakespeare shows around America with sort of four, you know, people who are just graduating from the universities around the country. It's called the Oxford and Cambridge Shakespeare Company because that's what sold tickets, but it was from all sorts of places. I got Rick Mail from Manchester and different people who did well afterwards. Uh, from the student drama festival that then used to be held at Durham. And just sort of, uh, we just sort of did it with a, you know, a partner then who's still my best buddy who stayed in theatre. So did that for a few years. We, there's a place called the Bubble Theatre, which was taking theatre around, uh, around London parks. And well, anyway, the first, first Oscar, because that was Gary Oldman in the, in, the, in the company in 1979, that would have been. Um, and he was a pain in the ass, actually, but um, he was very talented. Uh, I don't know if I'd have given him the Oscar, actually. I would have given the makeup person if she did get the Oscar. <laughs> uh, but, I, uh, but anyway, he's, uh, he was obviously a very talented guy. Um, and, you know, what you come across, obviously, in this, well, I don't know, moved on then to radio production, television production, theatre production, stayed in the mix, and the odd movie. And I was trying to think of what the sort of themes were when you're working with comedians, writers, directors, designers, creative uh, beings, and um, what, and, you know, how one defines that talent in a way, and uh, in respect of, um, you know, w w what it is you're managing. Uh, and I, I really define it as the innate ability uh, for certain individuals to be, to be genuinely original. They just do things or imagine things it could be a novelist, obviously, as well, and playwrights. You know, uh, what it is, I think novelist is, is the most extreme form of it, um, where their, their ability is creating something from nowhere uh, and not imitative, and, uh, and, and composers, obviously, as well. And, you know, Tim Minchin, who's a primary theatre composer, as well as being a brilliant comedian, you know, and, and his Matilda is just a work of genius, I think. Um, Anyway, I found a quote from Schopenhauer, actually, which I thought summed it up, which, uh, of all people, um, said, talent hits a target that no one else can hit. Genius hits a target no one else can see. You know, and, and uh, genius should be replied as a rare uh, talent, I think, you know, an extreme talent. You know, and I would, for instance, put these people I mentioned, say, I would put Douglas Adams into that category. You know, I think his... Hitchhiker's Guide, new version, which is on air this week, I heard being trailed. I think those books will be read uh, in 50, 100 years' time uh, and stand the test of time due to their extraordinary um, originality and, 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 and perfection, really. So it's very, um, it's very rewarding to work with people like that. <laughs> well, you know, he was a very gauche fellow, Douglas, but such a lovely man, died tragically... Young age, 49. It would have been his birthday on Sunday, because we shared a birthday, actually. And uh, he was three years older than me. But, um, uh, and, you know, and I think of from other clients I work with, you know, some performance genius. Rowan Atkinson has his own sort of genius. And Armando Iannucci, an uh, alumnus of this fine university, uh, somebody I've worked with for 25 years, 30 years probably. And um, he can just create things that nobody else would do. It is a work of Armando Iannucci and his latest film, The Death of Stalin. You know, I don't know if you've seen that. I commend it to you. Just the, taking a subject, <laughs> the death of the world's greatest ever murderer, biggest ever murderer, into a comedy that passes muster and taste bounds and is about something that makes you think about the horror of that age is, a, you know, requires a very, very particular skill. And... Um, so, you know, I found that, you know, 
bit, bit like an art dealer. If you can spot the people with that sort of voice, I'm seeing Eddie Izzard doing a little piece in a charity show at the Palladium. Nobody knew he was a street performer, really, but somebody had had the gumption to put him on. And I thought, God, that guy is something special. And rang him up, and it turned out he wasn't really properly represented. He had a guy who was a bit of a wide boy who was trying to promote him. And again, worked with ever since. And he is, uh, he's got, again, a wonderfully original flavor to him as, a, as an artist, I think. And, uh, and a snappy dresser to boot, I think. <laughs> The uh, protest movement outside, we did, we, one thing I'd said as a joke to him, I said, we, he said, where did he want to start his next tour? And where do you want to go? And I said, why don't you go somewhere nobody ever goes, like the Western Isles? You know, six months later, they were on the Isle of Lewis <laughs> with a protest, doing a show on a Sunday with the local um, minister or man of the Scottish church, whatever you are, um, protesting about our performing on a Sunday, especially in high heels and lipstick. But... Um, <laughs> It was a you know, fond memory. Uh, so I think, you know, in a way, the, the role of the agent, manager, producer is, is a facilitative one. And in, in, in certainly in television and film, it is, it is helping talented people work with other talented people. So if you're Lenny Henry, do a show with Simon McBurney. These both people are all brilliant, but they are two and two equal five if you put people together, I think. Writers need really brilliant literary agents and editors within publishers uh, or, or directors within theatres, and that's a sort of different dynamic, but it's equally important. I think it's a very civilised world, literary agency, actually. Much more civilised than television and, and film, which is a bit more sort of, uh, well, just less civilised. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, and I think that's where the pleasure is. I've always thought it as a service business, really, principally. Uh, and they're, they're there to identify talent and to cajole and encourage, connect, and then maximize the impact. There's nothing more exciting than what you do when you do something that has huge national or global impact. You know, it is a, it is a rare bit, you know, to have the equivalent of your bestseller, you know, to make you know, Mr. Bean, which I've been introduced, you know, we now have 78 million Facebook friends. We haven't done a new episode for donkey's years, but, you know, it just worked. And the other things have been dramas, you know, that, and plays, you know, that, that, that have been, you know, I was thinking what, what I was proud of in the film Billy, Billy Elliot, which was very, very difficult to get financed. It only cost three, less than three million pounds to make. <coughs> and I actually, you know, went down on, on my knees in the... Uh, in the working title Universal Offices, with Stephen Daldry being very eloquent, saying, you've got to make this. We only need half, we only need half the money, and they were, we'd take it or leave it. You might get away with it, was the line they used when we got out and eventually got the money. But then when something like that, you see what comes out the other end, when it's in the hands of a brilliant writer in the shape of Lee Hall, a brilliant director in the shape of Stephen Daldry, with a wonderful story, of a life-affirming story, and then you go, uh, I remember going to the premiere, and I remember Tim Bevan, who is the working title, who did sign the cheque, even though they ripped us off afterwards, as usual. But um, he just said, remember tonight, because you don't get many nights like tonight. Because we know that, we just knew that it was going to go through the roof. And, uh, and so it's, you know, there are things, I think Matilda's like that, actually. You know, Matilda was a phenomenal show on the stage. Made a very uh, interesting play, very different uh, play, a, a documentary f drama on the bombings in Omar, trying to bring the perpetrators to justice. I think that was very, with Paul Greengrass, so, who worked for me at the time, so he's become a you know, world famous uh, film director, but a uh, you know, very activist filmmaker at the time, and he'd done other things on the, on the Lawrence murder. But this was bringing people to justice, working with the community, working again with brilliant writer, brilliant filmmakers. And so that it has moments of just total, We've done it, you know, you've registered. And that's, uh, that's a very good part, even if you're the guys and girls behind the scenes on that. I think it's, you know it's collaborative and you know it's uh, important. You know, culture is so important to our lives. And I think the BBC, I think BBC, uh, you know, it's a love-hate relationship. Anybody who works for the BBC, I hate them today, actually. Uh, but, um, and, uh, but they have allowed a cultural growth in this country over the decades, which is vital that they keep up, because I think it gives artists and 
writers and, and all the people who, who work in this sort of slightly difficult world where you're difficult to know where your next job's coming from. Some, something that doesn't exist in most countries. Uh, and, you, and I think the, the ability to fail, the right to fail, is absolutely fundamental. And you say it's your job, if you're the agent or the manager, to you know, create the environment where that is allowed to happen. And if the executives and the people commissioning are good enough, or the publishers, and they stick with it, very, people, very few people hit lightning to start off with. You know. it, it's a slow, and if, you know, I wind up now, I've been talking too much, but the, no, no, keep going. Um, <laughs> the qualities in the way, that in, in, in the people who become very successful, and I think it's easier to control your own success if you're creating your music or your words rather than being an actor where you're a victim of other people casting you, is you know, a total relentless perfectionism. That is a common quality of all the people that I've worked with who are really, really successful. I mean, obsessives. And it's, you've, again, you've got to embrace that because it usually has financial consequences. Somebody wants to re-edit something or re-rehearse it or wants another week, wants this. But it's worth it. <laughs> Because uh, if, they, if, if any, as soon as you get into it, oh, that's all right. Got it. That's in the can. You sort of know it probably isn't. You know, it's, can that be done? You know, Ron Atkinson, I mean, he's the worst example of this because, I mean, he drives people nuts by, you know, retakes and sometimes think actually it's almost over, uh, overplaying that. But you'd rather it that way than just say, let's move on without having really known you've nailed it. Uh, and again, I've seen when I've seen writers who just go draft after draft after draft and play it out and you can workshop it and you can test it, out of that comes, uh, you know, we're a very creative country and we've got great infrastructure behind us. I think the university is amazing and the opportunities people provide. I think the drama schools, some of the, the theatres, we don't have enough producing theatres and new work's difficult to get on, but it can be done, as Barney is, uh, is proving. Uh, and it's very important to our natural and uh, national well-being mm. and we're d d very deserving of support. So I think, um, you know, so my, when I was trying to think of all these little threads, so you need perseverance, partnerships and patience. <laughs> uh, uh, and having been lucky enough to get the people you want to work with, you know, some slip through the net. And there are many projects and, and people who have got away or when decided not to. Back at the time, I was reg regret not getting more involved with David Walliams, who came for representation once, but he came, I was less keen on his partner, Guy, Matt, you know, who's okay, but David. And David is the most brilliant writer, isn't he? As well as performer and playwright and children's writer, and he's a very... Top earner at Harper Collins. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not surprised, you know, and again, he's a complex guy, but I, you know, when I ran, you know, for many years, I ran Comic Relief, and he just would do anything, he'd do amazing, he swam the channel, he swam the Thames, he'd, he'd just do anything for you, he was just an amazing man, really, in this slightly sort of odd persona, you know, but it's just there, he's got it. But you've um, got Eddie Izzard running marathon. Yeah, yeah, well, he did, yeah, 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 you know, and, and, uh, and again, working with Lenny Henry for 30 years, you know, he's an extraordinary man, and he, it's easy to take for granted, but Lenny Henry was brought up, you know, on the rough side of West Bromwich as an immigrant boy uh, in a very rough environment, uh, and won a national talent competition at age 16, and has never stopped working. You know, so he's an amazing role model, I think, as uh, what can be done against a lot of barriers. And when he did it, it was an amazing thing he did in his first, and you were probably new faces. Anyway, his show, the first clip, and he won these little heats of this talent thing. And then you go on telly, and he was doing impressions of people at the time, Michael Crawford and stuff with his back to the camera. And he was doing it all, and you know, all the mannerisms, the voices. And then he turned around, and it was a black guy. And people thought, bloody hell, where did that come from? You know, very clever. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, and he's a fantastic person. Um, one, one of those spine-chilling moments, but, but, but the people you've worked with, you must have had many spine-chilling moments when you saw them the first time. 
the real talent? Well, no, you can. It's a bit, it's a, it is a bit like seeing a masterpiece. You suddenly say, oh, that person. There are lots of very, very good people, lots of very talented people, and occasionally you've got somebody with just an extra touch of originality is what it usually is. Uh, and then that's your job, and I'm sure it's the same reading manuscripts. You can tell pretty quickly whether it's a good read or a great read, or uh, page two, that's enough read. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's, it's rare, real, real cultivated, persevered, real high-impact talent is, is rare. But we have more of it than most places because I think we have a culture that allows for it to grow, both in these, you know, institutions and in the, in the, in the sort of arts world out there. Laura, you, uh, you must have seen a lot of first novels in your time. Uh, what was it that decided you that uh, a, a, an under-30 Barney... Uh, ha had what it uh, had what it took to uh, to be published. Well, the story goes back a bit because Barney and I knew each other at the university here, um, and I had seen prior to Barney sending me his novel, I had seen a couple, maybe two or three of the plays he'd written, um, and sort of knew that he had talent in that area, and then was delighted when he sent me the novel. And it was kind of, you know, talking with Peter about, you know, seeing something in that moment, you know it's brilliant. It was kind of, it's with reading a novel, what's actually kind of really exciting to me is reading something and going, I know this can be brilliant and I know how I can help. <laughs> uh, okay. um, so it was kind of that. I mean, with, cause what, what percentage of that first draft do you think went into the final thing? Of, maybe five. Maybe five? Yeah. <laughs> that, that might be unfair. Maybe ten? Oh, uh, <laughs> <so> maybe five. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... <coughs> I mean, I knew his writing was brilliant already. Reading, I mean, I always say to people, Barney's first draft is better than anything polished by most people. But it was just about seeing that I knew how I could help him write his first book. It's, that's what I love about my job, that collaboration. Um, which is, you know, I, I produced plays when I was a student here. Um, that kind of why I wanted to work in publishing is that real and why I want to be an agent in particular is the editorial input and that collaboration on an you know, individual personal level from the beginning. Um, and that was really exciting because, you know, Barney's a great playwright. I knew he could be a great novelist, but writing a novel is a very different endeavour mm. and, you know, longer and harder. And um, once it's on the page and, you know, set and printed, that's it. And that's a kind of, that was a quite different process for you as well, wasn't it, to kind of figure out how to do. To play the development of the play is sort of longer in a different way. Um, so he, it was a beautiful piece of writing, um, but it wasn't quite the novel that I knew it could be, and then we made it be that over a period of... It wasn't very good at all, really. It's um, not no. <laughs> <laughs> it's not what I said. <laughs> it's interesting, and... Listening to, to you, because I think um, one of the big differences with, with hearing some, some of the people that you've worked with is that, um, I don't know, maybe it's all different for you now and you're super cool, but we, we didn't have, because um, it doesn't feel like that coming from, not that I've got what like Lenny Henry's got, but you know, it feels like this terrible, hopeless floundering which someone eventually, and it's, and it's so interesting to, to hear someone talking about, and I think perhaps part of the difference is when you've got serious clout, you can call Eddie Izzard to go, do you want to, you know, <laughs> and be, because... Yeah, and I mean, I mean that's, that's the thing about, you know, us working together, because we were both early on in our Kid, careers, yeah. yeah, and it was, you know, our careers have sort of grown together in that time. So that was the kind of, that's sort of the difference between, I suppose, where we're at, where we were at, and where, you know. Yeah, but, yeah. Although I started off was working with my mates. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's that's the same exactly thing, the same isn't it? Thing, but it's yeah. so, you think about the way that that, that kind of recruitment changes. Um, I, Michael Longhurst has a, has a good line about early in his career, the way he got shows on was that he picked up the shows that had got to the last but one script meeting and worked out why that had been a no and then did a production that tried to cover that up as best <laughs> he could. And I thought that was a great line about, like, early, you're kind of hustling and, mm -hmm. and there's this luck to, if you meet Andre Tijinsky or if you meet Nick Heitner, or then, then suddenly things, 
things lock in because you're working, as you say, with, with talent and then, then that, that happens and that goes somewhere. But there is also this kind of um, hustle stage where personally, so running a theatre company with no money, I've read a lot of unproduced plays that have then gone on. I've never read a play that was truly great because they go, they go to someone else. They go into a different inbox, you know. And so there is that thing about needing to batter something into mm. being a little bit, I think. Well, that's been my experience so far, um, which is quite heartening to hear <laughs> might change. <laughs> Maybe. And plays are very delicate artifices, aren't they? They're, they're a very... Great plays are very difficult to create, aren't they? And, you know, the whole delicacy of them. But they are out there. We were talking earlier about I mean, this play, Consent, I thought was just superb at the Dorfman. And Sierra that was at there. least five years in the writing. Was it really? That commission. Yeah. Sort of, it, that would go along with the obsessive mm. bit, but it was such a perfect piece of writing, brilliantly acted and directed. Mm. Uh, last year, so we were trying to get it to transfer into the West End. There's been some tricksy producer we need to get out of the way, I think, or something. I don't know what happened. I don't know what the story is, but anyway, it might well happen, and I do commend it to you if it does go. I know the tricksy producer if you want the story later. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but um, the, and we were talking a bit about Hamilton earlier as well, the the way that that show with. America has a slightly different workshop culture in the theatre, doesn't it, around assuming that stuff will take five years to get good rather than putting it... Where, whereas, kind of at the peak of British theatre's productivity, the whole point of the Royal Court was that you staged the delivery draft and you didn't do any de development work at all, which is extraordinary. It kind of leads to some really strange storytelling that hasn't had the corners knocked off at all. But Hamilton's a great example of a show that... I don't know, it probably was quite good at the start, actually. But, you know, like, probably the reason it's doing what it's doing is that it had that, that, that depth of development, that depth of... Yeah, and you can get a slow burn, can't you? And that happens with novels as well, you know, because, I mean, one of the big, one of the big challenges, I think, in, in, in the more of the television world, you, if you're trying to go into the deep end or it's been the theatre world, putting a new play on at the Olivier Theatre is a very testing thing to do, and doing a... The most challenging spot on television is BBC One at 8 o'clock if you're doing narrative stuff because there's just an expectation that it's got to have a certain audience number. And it's very satisfying when you nail it, <laughs> but it's quite rare. So the, the Vicar of Dibley was an example of that. It was a pre-Watershed sitcom, but about something that was happening in society, but in a very sort of folksy way. So the women vicars was a real issue. The synod were getting all worked up about it. So working with the church a bit to get the arguments around that, but basically having it set in Great Haiti where Richard lived with all the uh, weirdos, <laughs> you know, or whatever, or characters rather than weirdos, just different characters, just based on different people in the village, you know. And, uh, and, and, and it's, but it's quite rare. I think the process of, of slow burn development, the sort of bird song type thing, where people you just see people reading the same novel that they had a low print run to start off with. It yeah. must be it's a wonderful uh, thing that can happen. How slow a burn was Mr. Bean? Because you know, those of us that watched the 2012 Olympics, there was Mr. Bean up there as the recognisable uh, English cultural icon, along with James Bond. But but where did you start from to get <coughs> to the 2012 Olympics? Well, funny, on the stage of the Oxford Playhouse, actually, as a student stuff, you know, same Dean Curtis, Howard Goodall, who's a long-term client and friend, and uh, multi-talented, uh, doing it as part of Oxford Reviews and things, with this sort of ghost character. And then we said, well, let's see if it can turn into television that can travel. It was a planned exercise, and a very good one, because we said we don't want to be paid for it, uh, and, and own it at the time pay for the production but not the fees and anyway the deal was done and um, but we tested it out again we came back to the Oxford Playhouse in the late 80s I suppose and just played around with it uh, with some sketches which we then this guy a wonderful producer at Temple after it, the BBC who said would my 10 minutes late night channel 4 I'm still waiting for the reply and this one brilliant guy at, IT, at ITV who had been head of comedy at BBC and had produced the Pythons called my, uh, John Howard Davis said, well, I'll give you half an hour of ITV prime time. 
And uh, so we did a pilot, went IPV prime time based on this stuff we'd done down the road. I remember the only time I ever stayed in the Randolph Hotel. I didn't remember that. And, uh, uh, and it just went through the roof. And now we have this incredible pro global property. It's sort of this every man that all kids, as well as families, sort of weirdly identify with, or because he's like a ch child in adult clothing. But it wouldn't have happened without Richard Curtis, no doubt about it. It was his creative vision, saying, well, we can make this, and, 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 and obviously the situations then you create um, work for that character. So I don't, we haven't given up on it yet. I'm doing another animated series at the moment and might even do some more live actions. So it's been, that's been a great thing. To, I mean, I call my house Bean Towers. You know, it's, 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 uh, I'm very proud of this. It gets very bad press here compared to anywhere in the world. And I've travelled extensively, you know, with my um, charity world. And there's nowhere in the world I've been where they do not know Mr Bean. It's absolutely <laughs> amazing. In the middle of nowhere. Do you think yeah. it gets bad press here? What? Ish, yeah, we, yeah. I mean, it doesn't really worry me. No, you know, sure. but, it's, uh, <laughs> but it's never won a reward in this country or anything like that. No, no. And, and I couldn't get it. I can't get any broadcaster to play the live um, episodes. Those, I had them on video, those 10 minute. No, no, at all. Episode. They won't, I can't no, give it away. No, no. They just say it's too old for not for us. The world's move on. But the rest of the world, it's everywhere. Yeah. And they're you know. horrible. That, there's this, <laughs> this, you know, well, you probably do know, um, um, when he has to change into his swimming kit <laughs> without, without uh, uh. getting his kit off, and then at the end, the person he's been trying to, is, is blind, and it's uh. so horrible, <laughs> sort of Simon McBurney, uh. sort of high performance art, and just sort of watching this. I played the blind man in Hong Kong and Bahrain, actually. It was one Did of you? Great performance here. <laughs> Great. But not a very exacting role. But uh, yeah, yeah, good fun. And, and uh, yeah, and I think, in a way, anything that has that sort of impact, just to entertain, really, is very pleasurable. So when it came to the Olympics, and then it was an odd coincidence because the, the, it was done with the symphony orchestra, conducted by Simon Rattle, who I had been at school with as a young boy in Liverpool. And who was my, you know, at that time, my best buddy. Although I lost touch, we had a joint 17th birthday party and went our separate ways. But obviously, I followed his career, and then they came together again. <laughs> it was that we came together. These guys came together, so that was a very gratifying thing, really. And you know, I wanted to ask you both, um, if you don't mind, about tribes. Um, partly because I'm struck by the fact that some of the people you talked about working with at Cambridge are still kind of the people you'd cast now, which is quite striking, um, or, or, you know, hire now to do, to do the job, you know, if you were, if, if the budget was unlimited. Um, and because I think you're in a moment where, as I understand it, you're building one. And I'm interested in how people do that and how you identify that and how you work with that. John Bishop has this line which I found really helpful and really clarifying um, around the way that comedians land is if they identify somehow in their work their tribe, the people they're speaking for, the people they are articulating and entertaining. And maybe, maybe you'd say that's kind of chance and that's the crew that you were drinking with and that became the crew that you were working with but I do think there's a little bit more about how that gets shaped and I think you're having to do quite deliberate searching at the moment mm. aren't you like I mean, through the slash pile for yeah. I mean because I suppose it's slightly different because my list of authors it's sort of an individual partnership between me and each of my authors and my list is fairly varied across all different types of fiction and non-fiction um, and so there are lots of different ways in which I've found authors in the past and there are lots of different ways in which I'm looking for authors now. You know, you and I knowing each other is unusual in terms of how I've you know, found authors. Um, there's the slush pile, which is you know, a, a derogatory term for a very you know, <laughs> important part of our work. But, um, you know, and there's creative writing courses and ideas we have and reading and you know, journalists and all sorts of different ways in which we find talent. So 
the way I, I choose who I'd like to represent is firstly based on quality of what I'm reading, very kind of subjective me personally, whether I'm, you know, whether I like what I'm reading. Secondly, whether I think it has potential in the market. And thirdly, because it's, it's such a close relationship between author and agent, I always try and meet with people before I kind of officially offer them representation because it's so important, you know, that we get on, that we have a kind of parity of vision and that we understand each other editorially and as people and that you know we could the, the thing about being an agent is that in an ideal world you work with the people you work with for their entire careers for your entire careers and thank you for nodding Barney um, <laughs> and um, and so you know it's life's too short to work with people who you know from the off are going to be extraordinarily difficult, I think. You've got to really like them. Yeah, because otherwise, you know, I want to work on books that I'm really proud of. It can be of difficult, but you've you, you got to like people. proud of the, the author. And, like, the best bit of my job while I'm done is get that moment when I get to call a, someone who at that point wants to be a published author and tells them that we've got them a book deal and they're going to, you know, that's their baby, that they're going to be, they're going to be published. That's the most exciting, wonderful thing, because that turn someone's life around because, you know, that's it, that's what we've all been working for. And if I care about the person as much as I care about the book, then that's, that's the whole thing. Yeah. Peter, how does that resonate with you? Yeah, no, I think you've got to respect and like people. Yeah. You know, and sometimes it goes very rarely, it goes wrong. I've got rid of a couple of people just because yeah. it's usually an acid test if they're rude to people in your office. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you should pretty... Uh, you know, anything would be rude to me, but if that, you know, so uh, there's one guy, fairly regular guy on QI, actually, I don't know, I don't know if you guess. Uh, you know, I just, you know, found him awkward talented, but, you know, ultimately. So I think um, you, you need to, yeah, and you can grow with people as well, you know. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, I've worked for you know, 20 odd years with uh, Barry Humphreys who I thought it would be a better world if Barry Humphreys is doing something that we could all see than not. But I did a bit of research and found he'd fallen out with everybody, every agent he'd ever had, over money. Mm. So I said, well, we're not going to do that. So if you go and do your deals on your own, and I'll find out about it later, I won't be cross. And he still does it. He usually sells himself short when he does it. <laughs> and then he... Uh, but I just decided not to be something not to be annoyed. Normally, you wouldn't allow somebody to do that. You know, you do it all or do nothing. Uh, and, uh, but we've had enough fun together. And the, the other great thing, when he knows he's behaved slightly badly, or, you know, you know he buys you the most amazing presents. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the most, I think one of my most, most treasured possessions we were talking about his time in the, in the sort of 60s when he came over, in the late 60s. He'd come over from Oz and he was best buddies with uh, that crowd, the establishment cover with Spike Milligan. And they were always trying to sort of stitch each other up and, you know, and uh, Spike Milligan, again, was a, a total genius. And I said how much I loved the novel Pacoon, which was set in a beautiful Irish set novel and uh, funny, funny, funny. And two days later, it's beautifully brown wrapped parcel with string around it, and I undid it. And it's the proof copy of Pacoon, dedicated by Spike to Barry, uh, and then dedicated on to me, saying and was saying, you know, thanks for everything. So that yeah. that's a moment, you know. So uh, you know, incredible act of generosity because he's a great collector, Barry. So giving something like that away must be quite a tough thing to do. <laughs> uh, so these, you know, these people are amazing, you know. And Barry Humphreys had a career of. 60 years, really. Never missed a show. Um, can I ask you, I'm sorry, sorry just to, um, while you mentioned Spike Milligan, um, with the people you work with, which is a family and which does become, you, you know, the people you're close to, um, does it feel like you're feeding them into a wider tradition or does it feel like a heist? Does it feel like a smash and grab? Like you've, do you know what I mean? You've taken the, taken the screens for an evening and so on, or is this a sense of, you know, does your generation form part of everything else, or are you a gang? No, I think, uh, not a gang so much, I mean, there are groups of people who do things, no, but everything, you know, if you manage to get 
a film made or something published or a television program commissioned. You know, that is a fantastic opportunity. I think people always think they've got the sweet, you know, have the sweet shop every time, really. Nothing, come, nothing falls into your lap, it's funny. Even, you know, very things you assume were an easy sell, and they're never an easy sell. And the same as I, I think all authors find it quite difficult to get their first novel published, don't they? The second novel published. Yeah, they do. And uh, because, on you know, the whole, it's much easier to foster things that have you know, imitative or happened. And that's the trouble with Hollywood. It's just everything has to be sold on. It's, you know, James Bond meets, you know, car crash or whatever. Mm. And actually what you're looking for is, is an original voices, but that's not really what Hollywood's about, is it? How did you meet Dylan Moran? How did, how did that come about? More, I've got a colleague, a partner in my business, and she's always loved Irish boys. <laughs> and, uh, she married a bad one, actually, but they're that great guy. But, you know, they like a drink, don't they? And there's some of them. And, um, yeah, I think she met him seeing she doing shows in uh, in Ireland when he was living there, and we look after Tommy Tiernan, who's another wonderful Irish, Irish-based comedian chat show, doing a show at the Abbey Theatre at the moment as an actor. You know, there's a great there's a great bardic condition, you know, um, tradition in Ireland, isn't there? These are very poetic um, comedians, really. And Barney, um, yeah, well, I mean, Ireland's inspired some of your work more recently. Yeah, I. Um there, there is a sort of weird, um, difficult to explain, extraordinary culture, which maybe is the tax breaks. <laughs> That's important to say is that, you know, you still, for the first quarter of a million, it's tax-free, if the, the Irish Arts Council thinks so. But they put in the quarter of a mil for Heaney and you too, which terrified me that Seamus Heaney used to make more than a quarter of a million every financial year. Um, but apparently he was one of the people they put the, put the cap in for. But I don't know what that... You know, I'm being slightly... But, but the, there is this extraordinary tradition of creativity, which, which is very difficult to understand and very um, difficult not to envy, actually, the function of the writer in the society. Yeah, and it's... it's I don't know how often you get it, but it is part of the culture. It's just the shooting the breeze, isn't it? The, the storytelling charm it is again it's sort of deeply rooted there's yeah. also i think maybe a slightly it's that there are bits of english culture which so i remember noticing the last time i was in dublin that there was a poster for krista burr's next gig and sort of thinking <laughs> i don't really think there's a city in england where that makes it onto the billboard yeah. anymore and maybe that kind of the the hyper commercialized culture um, that is the poster or the, the ad is maybe a little less... Pre you know, I mean, in Sligo, <coughs> there is a very good wall, wall mural of Westlife. You know, there's, there's, there's pop culture, but it's, you know, the wolf tones are still big, you know? And that's, that's really strange. And I don't think Rita Ora is... There is an equivalent. I think maybe that's part of it. There are layers of... Americanization that haven't necessarily happened in the same way, perhaps. Yeah. It's quite a hairy place to sell promote shows in, because people come very late. Completely different by purchasing pattern. So you're looking, you know, two weeks out, and you say, oh, blimey, it's all 15%, and then it just sort of goes. Uh, and it's a totally, I don't know why, why that is, or what drives that, but it's, it's every time. And they're late buffers. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. You haven't taken Joanna Lumley there yet. You've taken her to India, Japan. Is, is Ireland next? And when we're going to no, see... Uh, well, we're hoping... Uh, uh, well, it's, in, it's a very contentious thing at the moment. Well, not contentious. It's uh, part of the things of making television. Because I have very small television interests left, but I do get involved with her. And she is one of the most wonderful... What you see is what you get with Joanna Lumley. She's a wonderful, wonderful woman. And um, anyway, we went to be doing a journey on the Silk Road. But the... China is slightly difficult at the moment because the Chinese noticed that you did an, an interview with uh, Dalai Lama. I don't know if that's the reason why we're finding visa difficulties, but I suspect it is. So we're trying to negotiate more of an Asian adventure, which does some Silk Road, but doesn't get to the, the end of the Silk Road. Um, so uh, uh, anyway, so that's actually uh, an issue going on this week. But uh, anyway, the next journey will be Asian. 
but following something of historical interest. You know, it'll have a narrative of some sort. Um, and she's a very good traveling companion. Mm. And the great thing is, what you drama quite a lot of these things over the years, and why comedians and performers like that are so good, and Palin being the other great example, who's the other, what you see is what you get person, who's the least complicated person I've ever come across, is that, um, and another son of Oxford, of course, uh, he, he, they can just think, talk, walk, and charm people at the same time. Their, 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 their creative writing skills sort of exist alongside their performance and engaging engagement skills. And when you try and get straight actors to do it, they don't have that, they don't think that way, they don't interact that way. So that's why I think quite a lot of the, you know, it's that type of person who take you on a lovely journey, you know, which is very, tends to be a pretty gentle type of television, but it can be very informative and very, you know, engaging. And they're the two, you know, he, well, he's the ultimate master, obviously. Yeah. But, but taking Joanna Lumley through Japan, I mean, it was, it was a gentle journey, but there were some very moving parts. Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. fascinating. And, and the, the, my eldest boy works for a travel business, and he says, you ought to get a, do a deal, because the boosting, the sales <laughs> for Japan <laughs> went shooting through the roof, you know, when, uh, after that series. So... Uh, you know, because it just opens up a world that not many of us are familiar mm. with, really. Yeah. Oh, I only went to Japan, Tokyo, once when we were launching Mr. Bean in some way, and uh, I remember they moved the, I think it was the King of Spain or somebody, out of the presidential suite in the hotel we were staying <laughs> to allow Mr. Bean in there. <laughs> Royalty. Yeah. An emperor, perhaps. Mm. Um, should, we, should we move to the floor and, 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 and take some questions? Have I, have I thrown you in the deep end there, Jenny? You're not normally jumping up and down, <laughs> running your hand across your throat, but, yep. Uh, if there are some questions, uh, yep. Uh, Peter and, and Laura, uh, you, you both gave fascinate, fascinating insights into how you add value. Peter, you talked about um, uh, the culture of allowing failure being something that's valuable here. I wonder whether you can think of, and, and Laura too perhaps, in, in your different uh, world, of artists, writers, um, whom you have judged to be potentially hugely successful but who haven't actually, despite your best efforts, made it. And what conclusions have you drawn from that about what either you or they might have done differently, which you've then drawn to the attention of others? Mm. I mean, um, it's a reality of my job that when I take on an author, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'll be able to sell the book to the publishing house. Getting an agent is a first step for a debut author, but um, not everything that we work on and represent sells initially. Sometimes it's a process of redrafting, getting it right, taking on board more feedback, because you know, when we're working on something, as I said, so subjective, um, I can be convinced of its brilliance, but for whatever reason, um, or it's a case of, you know, that's, that's like what I was saying before, the nice thing about being an agent. Um, going, okay, right, that, put that book in, in a drawer for now, let's work on something new. And that does happen that so the first book that some people write isn't necessarily the first book that gets published. But um, it's, uh, that's not really, those aren't really specific examples, but that's kind of the general way of it. It's quite common that it's a... a it's a, it's a fight, it's a difficult, and the market's difficult, and um, we have to work on things very hard to get them out there. And then even once you get a publisher, there's no guarantee that it'll sell or that they'll get a second deal. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's a process. Yeah, I, it definitely happens. Mm. Maybe it's, it's something to do with the, the tribal thing that Barney, you know, John is quite an interesting example, because he was a salesman, you know, and, um, and his marriage was cracking up, and he's a, just a you know, regular scouser. And, uh, and he used to go partly as his own therapy to a comedy club on Mondays, and, and in Liverpool, just off Hope Street there. And he, 
And he thought, well, I could do this. And so he started doing it. But he was 40 or something, you know, and uh, 30s or whatever. And he just found he, he could do it. And he, because he was, had his, you know, it's got a scouse humor, really, hasn't he? And, he? and he's got his own tribe. And he got his following. Like Lee Evans, who was a sort of, always known as a bit of a white band man, comedian, but brilliant, brilliant, brilliant actor as well. And they have, they hit a sort of nerve, a national nerve. And I think the people who don't have got talent, but somehow they don't hit a nerve to get a, the, 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 the following they probably could, a bit of luck, but sometimes to do with the charm of the individual. Lack of charm can be difficult. You know, there was a quite a successful guy 20 years ago who was pretty tricksy, and he sort of, he went out of fashion. He was a very big sitcom actor and everything, because basically he lacked charm and decency in three respects, and I think ultimately people rumble that. They, well, they want to like you. Uh, and that's, you know, when you see new stuff, especially in Edinburgh, you see things and you think, God, that is so endearing. Uh, and uh, so I think that's a factor. And I think then other times it can be, it can be a bit unlucky. I get very frustrated. I've got a very talented, you know, correspondent brother who wrote a brilliant novel about, you know, he's a very big expert on Pakistan, Afghanistan, terrorism. Totally. And he just couldn't quite get it away. There's always a clash or this or that. I commend he's got a brilliant podcast that just finished last week, actually, called The Assassination. It's a 10 past podcast about the details of re the history of the assassination of former Oxford student Benazir Bhutto, mm. which I highly, it's, it's absolutely like a thriller and goes deep into uh, Pakistani state um, politics and interviewing all the, every, all the players. It's absolutely fantastic. The Assassination, available via the World Service. But he couldn't get that commissioned as a program. You know, so that's why I made it as a podcast, because the people, the gatekeepers are just, in his instance, slightly second rate. Uh, and, uh, but but I, I think there are things that don't get away, but on the whole, talent will out. We should ask Barney, was, that, was, the, was your first novel your first novel, or was it your second, third? Five first? to ten percent of it, yeah. It was, my, it was my first, but the sort of fifteenth time I'd written it. Um, so it's the sort of continuing. Mm. I'm thinking, I'm the, maybe someone who's quite interesting in this context is, is Donal Ryan, who mm. I share a, um, a publisher with, who's an Irish novelist, um, and an extremely highly regarded Irish novelist, who didn't get his first book picked up, um, which was a novel called The Spinning Heart, and then wrote a book called The Thing About December, which has... It's, he writes very short, he writes 40,000 word novels, and, that, and it has a, a sort of intensity and a pace through it. It's quite programmatic, uh, not necessarily as a negative. Um, uh, and, and, you know, um, and it does a very effective sort of trap closing mechanism job. That got published, and then the same publisher brought out The Spinning Heart, which was a huge hit, mm, actually. Won prizes, yeah. And won a lot of prizes, and was long listed for the Booker, I think and had been yeah. not picked up at all. And that was yeah. very interesting. And puts me in mind of a line of Auden's um, talking about the way that poets keep or don't keep their fan bases. And he said the stuff that readers fall in love with tends to be the early work when they discover the writer. And so they fall in love with this artist who's got their first book out. And that's the moment when the writer is at their least powerful and is making the most compromises for the financial interests which are shaping them into a brand. And as the writer goes through their career, they slowly sort of eschew these artistic strictures that were put on them. And as they come into their own and feel like they're really doing their own thing, alienate the fan base they discovered. So just as they get into the feeling of like, this is what I wanted to, yeah, come on. So I, Auden may have been talking about his interminable verse dramas, um, <laughs> which are really, you know, I. Was acted in one in here, and they're terrible. And <laughs> it was so poor, and and because it's unstageably weird and th like a joke. And I think he, as he became more himself, perhaps lost some of the people who really loved. Oh, what is that sound that fills the air down in the valley? Drumming, drumming, only the side. You know, the the sing song of early order goes away. And I think that does. <coughs> Sometimes it's about not being able to persuade people that your thing is the thing people, you know, need, isn't it? 
<laughs> and silence. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, I think that's. Yeah, I mean, I, I, certainly in, in one of the excitement when uh, popular novelist, but brilliant novelist, in my view, the when Le Carre was doing his smartest people, smartest people. I found funny. I was looking at the copy the other day, and I would be, I would be always queuing up for a new Le Carre at that stage, and whatever disciplines he had in place, and the publishing and the agenting behind him. With his, his, uh, with the honourable schoolboy and the smartest people, and these phenomenal television versions of them, that you know, and then it finally went into a sort of slightly less high impactful patch and choosing off subjects, and then came back to writing. I thought, or thought, you know, better stuff, and again, some of which made very good uh, films as well, and the Night Manager being a recent one, actually, as, as a worked in both media. So yeah, I, I you know. I don't know if he'd agree if, as a writer that he had, you know, a purple patch and a lull and a, then a second, you know, purple patch. But I, I think in performance terms, I think people are pretty consistent, actually. Have you ever resuscitated an, an actor or actress or stand-up that has sort of gone into that lull and, well, and you sort of shook them about and took them up? <coughs> well, I out? tried with Frankie Howard. Oh, OK. Actually, because he'd gone completely out of fashion. And I tried to get a thing going with him with uh, Channel 4. Frankie goes to Cricklewood all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Clive Anderson and somebody else, who uh, was another mate from university days, writing, and Clive's a brilliant writer, and um, funny writer. But Frankie, oh, blimey. Um, I had a very amusing uh, time. I made the mistake of going to his house in Edward Square on my own, and uh, Frankie, uh, which apparently is not, you know, not, not what you do with Frankie. And, uh, Anyway, he gave me a large brandy. I said, no, you should have a drink. And then, um, anyway, he was, uh, I, had a, the, 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 I, I was told the knack was, if Frankie started trying to misbehave, you had to try and knock his wig off. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, but he, we tried very hard. And they're funny, he did, you uh, didn't get that off the ground. But we did get enough interest that he did have a little late, you know, a late couple of uh, programs and things, and uh, uh, you know, and he'd still do his panto and all that sort of stuff. But he just got some late acknowledgement of his own particular talent, which was a particular talent, you know. Um, so that was the, probably the clearest example. I mean, Spike had tried to do something with Spike, but he was so he was so odd by the end that you couldn't really you couldn't really do it. But you sort of want, it's a bit like, you know, that's why I love Barry, you know, Barry Humphreys there in his 80s, just carrying on, you know, writing brilliantly. You know, it gets fun, it's like doing a wonderful documentary and a lovely live show he's doing now about the, um, when he was a young man in Melbourne in the 30s, my boy, really, and um, he'd go and buy this sheet music, no, the 50, 50s, yeah, 50s, from the 30s, uh, of, um, people who tended to escape from Nazi Germany and it was just sitting there gathering dust and he, you know, he's so culturally engaged. So he brought all this stuff up and he made a brilliant documentary last year for Sky Arts and it does now does a show about it of these, not all lost because it was a bit of Kurt Vile and stuff in the mix, but otherwise composers who would have been totally lost to the world, uh, that he'd kept the music. And then found out about them, went back, researched them. You know, what a, what a joy to work with something like that. You know, and he said, oh, I can't see myself. I hate seeing myself on television. I look so old, but he looks so elegant in these Austrian outfits. And, uh, you know, it's actually stunning intellect in these things as well. You know, working with uh, modern day composers, talking about it. So that is joyful, that sort of creative relationship or working with somebody of that creativity late in their life, I think, you know. And, uh, and there's a lot of wisdom in old people, you know. And you, mm. I got to know Roger Bannister, who died last week, as we know pretty well, because he was always hungry, wanted to tell his story, <coughs> convey his values. We made some couple of documentaries about it, you know, a true Corinthian that's person. Really and that's a great, again, a great <coughs> honor to be able to come across these people. Yeah, no, an extraordinary repository of wisdom. Uh, and I, and I, and I, uh, and an extraordinary athlete who was incredibly modest with everything. Yeah, and driven there. Yeah, driven. Mm. 
many drafts. There couldn't be many drafts. He got these <laughs> wonderful, wonderful books of when he was a medical student in the early 50s, monitoring his fitness through diet and things which have become standard now, which were not standard then, but because his medical training and because he knew what he was trying to do and had an objective, he worked it out, basically. <laughs> And it just a fan. It all, he's got all the records. It's absolutely incredible. You know. And on that day, he broke his famous record. He'd done a ward run that morning in St. Mary's Paddington. You know, incredible, different age. But the same, funny enough, just total perfectionism. You know, uh, uh, and determination. You know, he was, um, you know, he could be extremely stubborn if he wanted to be. You respect. You know, but wonderful man. Hmm. Another question from the floor. And one at the back. Thanks. Um, yes. About novels, and I was interested in what Barney was saying about Donal Ryan. It seems to me the reason the second novel did better than the first is that the first is actually quite an Irish book. It's about the ghost estates, it's about the collapse of the economy in the, in the banking disaster. Whereas the December novel is actually kind of universal, isn't it? It could be set absolutely anywhere. It doesn't have to be an Irish story, that, I think. And I was thinking of the, of the comment in, in the preface to the lyrical ballads where um, Wordsworth or Coleridge says, the great author creates the taste by which he is appreciated. That you have to educate your audience to some extent. Um, and I, I, I was really interested in what Laura was saying about getting a draft and then being able to see what you can do for it. Uh, and, and my question really to both of you is, how do you calibrate your judgment to know that then? I mean, how can you see the platonic idea of the novel <laughs> lying behind the draft as it sits in front of you? What, 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 what is it that makes that happen? Gosh, it's a tricky one. Um, I think it's, I mean, that sort of, getting to that point is like why I do my job like I think editorial work is something you're either good at or not but it kind of it's a very sort of case by case basis I mean I suppose it's two things it's looking at oh it's a, it's a difficult thing to quantify looking at how the book is working as a book on a technical level you know whether the voice is working, whether the plotting is working, whether it's hitting all the peaks and troughs that a book needs to hit to, to make it a satisfying whole. And that's just sort of experience and reading and instinct as much as anything. And then the sort of other side of it is, is there a way in which we need to help this book, not, not shove it into a hole in the market, but kind of help it find its place? Because, you know, writing a brilliant book, you know, ho hopefully if the book is brilliant it will find its readership but it's such a there's only space on the shelf for so many things there are so many books out there publishers want to get excited about a book that has a what we call the elevator pitch which is the one the awful awful one line pitch that people want so they can figure out what the book is and not every book has that Barney's neither of Barney's books do but they found no their readers them. That's not true, found the readers. You know what I mean? So it's kind of, I mean, it is a really nebulous, what is that X factor? How do I help bring it out? It's, you know, if I did read you, it... Did you hone that skill yeah. on the archive of literary history, as it were? I mean, did you... Did oh, you... no, I mean... If, if you're looking, at, if you're looking at, at Dickens, can you see the Dickenses that would work well now or that needed more work than the... Have you seen the I mean, great Dickens I, I, joke? This, I must tell you the great Dickens joke about you know, the discovery that the Tale of Two Cities was published in two local newspapers. It was the Bista Times, it was the Worcester Times. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's, that's a very, very... I didn't ask the question just so I could tell yeah. the joke. But anyway. I mean, I, like, my, I, I sort of mentally edit everything I read, you know what I mean? Switching that part of my brain off because that is... My job is really, really difficult. Reading for pleasure now is really, really difficult. Um, and you know, everything I read, I think, oh, I would maybe I would have suggested that or moved that here or what on earth is that doing there or that, you know. Um, and that's you know, it's through not just working on my own author's drafts. It's reading widely and 
Have you ever had to let an author go because he wasn't he or she wasn't listening to you? Um, no, not for that reason. I mean, it's again, that's what I was saying before about um, that sort of initial meeting. Not not necessarily talking through every single editorial note I will ever have, but getting a sense of whether how receptive the author is to editorial input because. You're fine, you're good. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, if, uh, if an author from the off seems very, oh no, but this is perfect, I don't, I'm not interested in, you just, you just need to do the business of getting this published, then that's not going to work out necessarily because I'm a very editorial agent. I really like doing editorial work. I think it's incredibly important to get the book as good as I think it can be before I try and sell it. Um, but also everyone has to do editorial work at some point. If they're not for taking editorial notes from me, What's going to happen if I sell the book and then they give their editor a hard time when they do whatever they do at the next stage? Uh, so, one last question at the back. Um, hi. So this is a question um, mainly for Peter. Um, so it was interesting what you said about um, how um, Rowan Atkinson was kind of spotted via the Oxford Playhouse. Um, I was wondering if an actor were to write to um, an agent or um, a casting director in London, how likely it would be in the current kind of age for them to come out to a show in Oxford or Cambridge and what it would be that would persuade them to come. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, <laughs> well, I think it's perfectly possible. I mean, it depends, again, what... Uh, sort of agency and what a thing. So I've, for instance, got a note, an email last week or the week before from current Footlights team, and I think they're doing a show here and a show somewhere in London, either way. And so I sent it out to my gang and said, you know, if you want to go to this, go and, you know, be all covered and stay the night and do work again, have some fun. So I encourage it with my, you know, younger um, agents or uh, assistants because in the end you're good as the next generation at any time. And, you know, I, I, I was fine going to comedy clubs 30 years ago and there was Reeves and Mortimer found that in a place in, 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 um, in Deptford, just, doing, you know, in, uh, doing shows. I think, God, these guys are extraordinary. Uh, so, but I think it's easier to do that than if you're a middle-aged old git lay or even older now. Um, so, I think it's possible, and I think with the, uh, the where there's been a source of success, you know, I mean, I mentioned Eaton earlier, you know, which is a bit Eddie ridiculous because the elder brother, but Eaton has produced a series of extraordinary yeah, actors because yeah. they have these three or four theatres there, and it's a bit like the drama schools, like RADA. I mean, they're amazing places these. So, um, so I think it is. Possible, but it needs something, yeah, distinctive. Either a very distinctive piece of work, or a history of something being very high quality, uh, or somebody you know helps. You know, somebody you know in the world saying, "Please do this." It's not easy. I see lots of young people trying to get on and get on the ladder and, and, and get along. And you just you just encourage people to support them. And if they're persistent enough, talented enough, you hope they come through. But it is bloody tough for an actor, I think. Very, very difficult world. Would, cause would you would would you would you encourage someone of that ilk to, to go to Edinburgh? Do you think that's somewhere? Well, I think if you're a comedian, it's probably good. We used to do a lot more plays in Edinburgh, and you can make an impact. And there was a big tradition then. And some Oxford actors from my generation made their first impression there. So, you know, Philip Franks, two or three. Uh, so, um, but there are fewer plays now, but they're still there actually. And the great thing about Edinburgh, there are just absolutely ram full of reviewers as well as agents and various riffraff, um, in which I include myself, um, who, you know, so there's a much better opportunity. It's, it is, it's like a huge showcase, really. And if something's really good, it will get noticed. No doubt about it. So that's, uh, but it's, it's it, I'll never say easy, but it's certainly possible. And you've got to be persistent and research it properly, you know, and see who these people are, and don't always ask the guy who looks after Claire Foy, you know, ask, the person who is his assistant or whatever. I or had a, assistant. a quick note on this. I was a PA for a couple of years, someone who'd get like two, you know, a couple of letters a day of that kind. Um, and literally two out of three of them um, 
Because it's a very frightening letter to write, and it's a very all-consuming, how do I differentiate myself, etc., etc., etc. Two out of three of the letters we received didn't have the question in, and that it had become so obvious to the writers of these letters what they were doing that they didn't put in... So it might have been, could I have a meeting? Or it might have been, can I play the lead in the next thing? Or it might have been, can I write? And they didn't actually... So you'd get a CV and a sort of... Uh, and the question wasn't there. And it's really simple, but two out of three of the letters, you didn't actually have an action to, 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 to make off the back of it because they, it wasn't in... I, I don't know if you ever come across that, but I used to find it extraordinary. And you'd sort of have to email back and go, if you're asking for a tea... Yes, <laughs> and if you're asking for a job, no, you know, and, or, or, or you know, maybe or whatever. But <laughs> but that that for me is a very helpful thing to bear in mind is that you've got to check because it's you write the letter so many times in your head before you write the letter. I think. Yeah, they're just saying it's different asking somebody to come and see a performance. But if you're asking for you know an introduction or going to an agency or something, I always advise people. Ask for a, saying, I'd like to come and get you, see you for your ad, a bit of advice, and then throw a bit of flattery. Because people respond to flattery and they like the idea of giving advice. Where they're nervous of is you're going to come in and say, you know, sign me up now or give us a job or come out to wherever. But if you say, can I have a quarter of an hour or 20 minutes of your time because uh, you're such a you know, wonderful boom, 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 boom. And uh, that tends to be a better way in. in the end, and again, how you. Right, it applied more, you know, I went around the television business, people wrote in, you know, just basic things there because you're looking for researchers and people who don't make mistakes, it's like a different thing. But if they made a mistake, if they spelled your name wrong or anything, I'd do, you know, gone. Mm. You've got to be pretty scrupulous because there, there, there's just too many people doing it. Okay. But, you know, but it's good luck and, you know, persistence all. I hope that was helpful. In many ways, those are very uh, one of the most important questions because uh, you know one of the objects of this Keeble debate was to try to help people in an artistic career uh, by listening to the many years of wisdom that Peter has and listening to uh, uh, to, to Laura and Barney, who uh, as a collaborative uh, exercise have got uh, you know two very fine novels out there. Uh, Barney and I will be back next term, Thursday, the seventeenth of May. Uh, the focus will be poetry, and we will, our focus will be Geoffrey Hill. And um, we have um, two, uh, some well-known actors and actresses up our sleeve. Uh, I'll just let a couple of names uh, drop, but we, uh, we uh, certainly at the moment have um, Simon Russell Beale coming to read some of um, Geoffrey Hill's poetry. So, uh, so that should be... Uh, very entertaining. So hopefully you'll join us then. Anyway, thanks very much, everybody.